which is presented in collaboration with the British Museum, the Open University, the Natural Environment Research Council Arctic Office and the Scott Polar Research Institute. Uh, I'm Professor Mark Brandon. I'm a professor of polar oceanography at the Open University and I've got some special guests and colleagues with me and I'll allow them to introduce them themselves. Uh, first, Dr. Jan Louvers, Jan Peter Louvers. Yeah. Thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Peter Lofers. I'm the project creator for the Arctic exhibition here at the British Museum. Thank you, Peter. And Professor Seanil Bagwat. Good evening. I'm Seanil Bagwat. I'm Professor of Environment and Development at the Open University. And Dr. Carol Brown Leonardi. Good evening. Um, I'm Carol Leonardi, and um, I'm a researcher at the Open University. And finally, but of course, but by no means least, Dr. Tatiana Arganova Lowe. Hello, I'm Tatiana or Tanya Arganova Lowe. I am an anthropologist at the University of Aberdeen. Thank you, colleagues. What we're going to do is uh, a, a few minutes with each of us as speakers about our particular views of the Arctic and then an open Q&A where we hope we get some interesting questions which will bring it more coherently together. Um, and we'll be finishing up at 18.45. Um, so we'll start first with me and I'll be talking about a general introduction to the Arctic and, and my particular take on the Arctic as a physicist. So that's a picture in uh, Svalbard in, in the high north. And I'm a, a Londoner. And as an East Londoner, you often get asked, how did you get into Arctic research and Antarctic research and polar research? Uh, that's me on the right as a kid. Um, I, I developed a love of the cold from a very young age and a wonderfully naive view of what the Arctic was like based mainly on literature and, and, and things I was reading as a kid. As I got older, I went to, to the Scott Polar Research Institute, uh, which is one of the centers of excellence of polar research in the world, and, and did a postdoctoral uh, research and PhD in Arctic oceanography, and went to the Arctic Ocean. Um, and what did I discover? Well, as a British person, when you think of cold, you, you, you tend to think of cold as being standing at a bus stop, feeling a bit miserable. But what I discovered at the Arctic was in winter, it's horrendously painfully cold. Um, but um, I, for some reason, I vowed I would never go back, and that was 25 years ago, and I still am going back. My own particular research is on the oceans and how the, the Arctic Ocean affects our climate. So I would go to these areas on the edge of uh, the frozen ocean and lower instruments through the ice. Um, it is a horrendously dangerous place. Not only is there the cold, there are also various animals. Um, and as a British person, things are different now, but as a British person, as a PhD uh, student, I was just sent off, dropped off by a helicopter onto the ice with a colleague, two colleagues and a gun. And you can see there, we've got the gun balanced carefully on a milk crate pointing away from each other. Um, and we would do our work trying not to, to be stalked by a white animal in a white background um, and doing our research. And it was a wonderful experience. After my PhD, I went to the British Antarctic Survey and worked in the Antarctic, uh, and then I joined the Open University. And over the years working in the polar regions, I've always been interested in connecting the polar regions to our lived experience. What is it about the Arctic that is important to people here? And in that sort of ambition to do that, that meant I got involved in working with lots of broadcast companies. And of course, one of the things that I, I've enjoyed most so far in my career which is this TV program. And Frozen Planet was a series I worked on for several years as one of the science advisors. Now, the interesting thing about Frozen Planet, one of the many interesting things is while we were in the, involved in the final script writing, uh, Sir David uh, Attenborough said that quote uh, and gave it to a newspaper. 
And you sort of think to yourself, how can someone give a quote like that when they obviously know so much about the region? And the reason is, of course, because the production team and uh, uh, the, the whole crew are involved in all of these people around filling in the gaps in the story. Now, I was lucky enough as a polar researcher to actually go on a shoot with them. And I went to a place called Svalbard in the high Arctic and we'll zoom into Svalbard. It's not very far away. If you left now, you would probably be in the Arctic uh, by tomorrow evening, if you could fly easily. And we'll zoom in a bit more on that. So if we zoom in to where I actually uh, managed to go on a shoot with them, we then zoomed up to a glacier and we did some filming in front of the glacier. Now, uh, Blue, uh, Frozen Planet was a, a co-production with the OU so we were interested in it to make TV programs as well uh, and to do teaching to support that. And we went out to this glacier by a skidoo, uh, which was a, quite a nice journey, set up all the equipment. It takes a huge amount of equipment to do a bit of filming like that. Um, and then Sir David arrived on his uh, helicopter because, of course, in a man in his 80s, is not going to go on the back of a skidoo for a few hours. But then he uh, joined the team. Um, and then we ended up uh, setting up a, a, a shoot in front of a glacier. And you can see there what an Open University academic does uh, on, on a shoot sometimes while Sir David is sitting in his chair eating some chocolate. Um, and uh, if you go to, to somewhere like that with Sir David, you have to get your photo taken uh, with him. It's obligatory. Um, and I was the last person. I very much like working in the background. I'm not a front person. And when I stood up next to him, I said, you know, sorry, this isn't really my thing. And he said, uh, it's OK. I feel a bit like a lamppost with dogs coming up. Um, so he has a very good sense of humour about things. But in the TV series, we were really interested in how can you get people to understand the Arctic and the importance of the Arctic? And one of the things that draws it together is that the Arctic is this global climate, climate, uh, global climate engine. It drives so much of what we do. So, so how do we get that and how do we allow the, or help the BBC to tell that story? And it's through clips like this. I'm standing at the North Pole, the very top of the Earth. Up here, it's easy to see why the polar regions are so cold. The sun never rises high enough in the sky to warm my back. And those rays that do strike the surface are mostly reflected back from this great whiteness. But the fundamental problem is that there's no sun here at all for half the year. The polar winter is unrivaled in its harshness, a night that lasts for months. Only the toughest day as temperatures plunge to minus 70 degrees centigrade. And so how do we talk about why it gets dark? Well, I actually had to do some filming out there. And if you're ever feeling that you're good at doing TV presenters... Anyone that doesn't live at the equator will already be familiar with the seasons. Winter, summer, autumn and spring. Now, with the help of my skidoo helmet, this frozen orange, I'm going to show you how that works. The skidoo helmet is my sun. Now, if that really was the size of the sun, the Earth would have to be about the size of a pea, and I wouldn't be able to show you this. So I'll use an orange. Now, my Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole at the bottom. And to make that more visible, I'm going to use this pen. Now, I'll put my Earth there. So the Earth is rotating once every day. And things on this side of the Earth are in sunlight, so this side it gets day, and this side it gets night. Now, the axis of the Earth's rotation isn't actually in this direction. It's inclined at an angle to the sun. Now, that angle to the sun means that in the northern winter, like we are now, the Antarctic is closer and pointing towards the sun. So the Antarctic gets more solar energy, it's warmer. In the north, it's pointing away from the sun. So there's less light coming in here. The days are shorter and it's much colder. But six months later, it's completely different because the Earth has orbited around the sun. And now, the North Pole is pointing towards the sun. So this is where you get the long days 
in the South Pole is pointing away in the Antarctic as a short days. Above the latitude of the Arctic Circle in the north, it's daylight all the time. So on this island at 78 degrees north, in a couple of days' time, the sun's going to come above the horizon, and it's not going to go down until, I think it's about the 20th of August. It will be what we call polar day. As the sun gets higher in the sky, all of the snow you see behind me will melt fairly quickly, and the plants and the insects will reappear. And there's just a short window for the other animals, birds such as fulmar, reindeer, even polar bears to grow and reproduce before the Earth orbits around the sun again and polar night comes once more. Now we put together clips like that with clips like this to build our courses. The small patches of bare ground that appear are darker than the snow, so they absorb more of the sun's energy. This accelerates the melt. Arctic tundra is unveiled. By tracking the sun, Arctic poppies catch its rays around the clock, so their flowers are always warmer than their surroundings. For early season insects, this warmth is even more valuable than nectar if they are to stay active in the cold. Now, because we're the Open University, we're not just interested in, in paid courses. We actually have, at the end of many of our TV programmes, what we call print offerings, where you can contact the, the, the BBC website, they will send you to the OU website and develop, or we'll send you things like posters. We sent out almost uh, 300,000 of these A0 posters on one side the Arctic, on the other side the Antarctic, and they're packed with uh, scientific information about the Arctic and the Antarctic regions. But with me talking, one of the important things that I've missed is something that we're going to hear from my four colleagues. I'm a physicist, I'm a, I'm a climate scientist working in the Arctic. And, and I went there thinking it's an empty place devoid of life. And the reality is it's a hugely populated place with lots of different types of indigenous peoples. And the indigenous peoples are the, that have lived there for tens of thousands of years. And that puts a whole different spin on it. And we'll hear about that from my colleagues. The one last thing I'll talk about is the seasonal changes in the Arctic are huge. This on the horizontal axis, you've got the, the month of the year. On the vertical axis is the extent of the Arctic sea ice. The black line is the average sea ice extent uh, for each month of the year, each day of the year. And you can see it tracking through winter and summer as it gets to the minimum. And the red line is where we were this year in 2020. And this was data from a couple of years ago. So we're now headed towards the winter when it starts to get cold again and the sea ice grows. And the last plot I'll show you, on the left-hand side of the plot, the yellow colours are where there is sea ice in the Arctic right now. Uh, this was taken by a satellite two days ago. And so yellow is 100% covering ice. On the right-hand side, what I've done is I've taken that data on the left-hand side and taken it from what the sea ice was like from 1989 to 1993. So the difference between the two tells us how much the sea ice has changed. So all of the red that you can see on the right hand plot is where there isn't sea ice at the moment and there was sea ice uh, 30 years ago. And so we're in a huge change at the moment in the Arctic. And with that, I shall pass you over to Dr. Peter Louvers. Thank you, Peter. Good evening. Thank you, Mark. In the following 10 minutes, I will give a brief overview of the city exhibition Arctic culture and climate. Central to the exhibition are the Arctic indigenous peoples. There are 40 different indigenous nations in the Arctic, with 400,000 Arctic indigenous people who live in seven of the eight Arctic states. <coughs> Before I continue, allow me to acknowledge one of these nations, the Gwich'in, and especially the elders of Fort McPherson in the Canadian North have been instrumental teachers in my introduction to the Arctic nearly 15 years ago. 
to them I say, Fang Quincy Shark, which in cut, drink Quincy and Joe cut, I cho. How did an exhibition about the Arctic come to London, you might wonder? Dr. Jacob Cooper, head of the Americas, conceptualized an exhibition on climate change in the Arctic during his job interview. This was 2013. Three years later, in 2016, Dr. Amber Lincoln joined the British Museum as a curator for North America. As lead curator for the exhibition, she has shaped the exhibition in its current form. Amber, like my own experience with indigenous people across the globe, Amber has worked extensively with indigenous people in Alaska, as well as visited indigenous communities in Sapmi and Saha Republic. These experiences guided us in bringing the Arctic to London through various collaborations with indigenous communities, institutions, and individuals. To them, we express our gratitude. The exhibition addresses climate change through the lens of weather. We understand climate as an abstraction generated in models that can be measured, whereas weather is a lived experience. Weather, as our Arctic indigenous teachers and collaborators have emphasized, is essential in the Arctic for traveling, building, food, materials, and ceremonies. To this, we add that these lived experiences are seasonal, which, amongst others, distinguish six seasons with spring breakup of ice and freeze up of ice, in addition to the four seasons of winter, spring, summer, and autumn. These seasons entail also specific activities around traveling, hunting, fishing, picking berries or medicinal plants, building reindeer, trapping, gathering driftwood or cutting wood, or making artifacts. Perhaps nobody has expressed this as clearly as the famed Inuit artist Kenosho Ashvak in her drawing, Nunvut Kwayanartuk, and apologies for my inuktitut, our beautiful land. This interplay between seasons and weather, as the drawing illustrates so vividly, can also be traced back in the exhibition. The enormous platform along the wall ought to offer the illusion of a vast outside icy landscape, while several sections are inside Arctic homes. The exhibition's design by Opera Amsterdam incorporates weather in the soundscape, where the visitor can hear, for example, the howling winds, cracking ice, birds or snowshoes going through the snow. The accompanying lightscape by beam follows the seasonal cycles in the Arctic and has been based on photos that Amber and I provided to them as reference points. Nearly all of the objects too tell a story about weather and seasonal lives. This becomes immediately apparent when the visitor enters the Arctic. The nine costumes in the welcome to the Arctic section so it's a variety of summer and winter clothing. The visitor might ponder about the materials. The skins came from animals who were hunted at particular seasons to get the right material properties. The hunted animals would also provide food. This is also made explicit in a wonderful video by the Mittematilik Arnaid Mixu Tweet Collective one of our indigenous collaborators in the exhibition in working with Nalua. Allow me also to acknowledge the seamstresses of the collective. Co-founder and seamstress Sheila Katsak and anthropology Nancy Wachowicz writes that Nalua, and here I quote, Nalua is a soft sealskin cured through a sequence of organic processes. It can only be produced in the darkest and coldest conditions, unquote. Nalua is used for the sole of a fancy boot. The video has also illustrates the vital importance of women's work in the Arctic, a theme that especially Amber has underscored when imagining the exhibition. My my professional rugby, my husband made it. Yes, you can look a picture and look rugby. The, the fur, I want to take it off. 
kagaratin. Ila kagaratin na kanyit ang aman na to. Iji juti magumami nga. So where does climate change come into play? As I mentioned before, Arctic culture and climate addresses climate change in a more nuanced way through the focus on weather and climate change and climate shifts. We try to convey to the visitor how Arctic indigenous peoples for over 32,000 years have been coping with climate and have been made hospital homelands out of ecosystems of ice. Natural climate shifts taking hundreds if not thousands of years led to a receding Beringia landmass and raising sea levels. Human-induced climate change, however, has been more recent and rapid. Within a generation, Arctic indigenous peoples have experienced drastic changes in seasonal patterns with erratic weather. Subsequently, as Christian elders told me, or as Inu Piat El Delano Bar states in the exhibition, weather has become more unpredictable with devastating impact on their lives. Nonetheless, as we show in the exhibition, Arctic indigenous people have used four similar strategies throughout history to combat change, namely adaptation, collaboration, resistance, and innovation. They have done this through ingenious technologies, which are plentiful to be found in the exhibition. The theme of climate change might be more subtle than to some of the visitors liking. Instead, we have looked for a balance between addressing the themes of climate change and weather and, importantly, to bring the visitor to the Arctic, which might be an exotic place for many, and transform their understandings of the Arctic or the North as it is also known. Furthermore, we want to leave the visitor with a positive mis message and perhaps something different than one might expect. We deliberately have left out the polar bears on floating ice. The message is that of hope and to let the visitor ponder how they could incorporate Arctic conditions people's strategies. Again, adaptation, collaboration, innovation, resistance into their own lives, as well as think of ideas of sustainable living to reverse climate change. Embassy of Imagination, another of our indigenous collaborators sums this up excellently. Their installation, Atikit Silapat, made of Japanese paper, parkas, by children from two communities in Nunavut at the end of the exhibition, is a testimony to hope and the crucial importance of the future generations. For that reason, they are, and I say it again, calling for reciprocal global action and solidarity during this time of transformation, unquote. Now let me conclude with one of my favorite objects, a question summer outfit to summarize. So when you see this costume, you could think about the themes that I mentioned here, weather, skills of seamstresses, food, and different strategies to confront climate change. Thank you. And hopefully we can welcome you at the British Museum and the exhibition once we reopen. And now I give it over to Sonil. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to talk about uh, Arctic uh, animals uh, as non-human persons uh, and suggest that if we think of animals uh, as our kin, uh, then we can safeguard the Arctic 
uh, their homeland uh, and also that of indigenous peoples uh, far better uh, than we currently do. Uh, Christmas is around the corner. Uh, my six-year-old six is very excited uh, to read about letters uh, from Father Christmas. Uh, this is uh, um, a series of letters written by J.R.R. Tolkien uh, to his own children um, several uh, dozens of years ago. Uh, and these letters still resonate. Uh, they portray uh, life in Father Christmas's home at the North Pole. Um, and uh, this is where you can find animals personified. Uh, so there's a polar bear character um, who uh, says, excuse thick writing, I have, I have fat paws. Uh, and I help Father Christmas with his packing. Uh, I live with him, I'm the great polar bear. And then Father Christmas goes on to tell more stories about animals and their antics uh, in, the, in his homeland. Uh, he talks about reindeer uh, running all over the country, breaking reins uh, and ropes uh, and tossing presents uh, up in the air. That's a very lively portrayal of life uh, in the Arctic. And indeed, uh, there is plentiful of life uh, in the Arctic. Uh, it's literally teeming with life. Uh, we see polar bears and reindeer and seal and narwhal, uh, but there are 21,000 species uh, in the Arctic uh, of a variety of mammals, birds, fish, invertebrates, plants, uh, and fungi. Uh, in 2013, um, a global exercise for Arctic biodiversity assessment uh, carried out by 250 scientists uh, and holders of uh, traditional knowledge uh, suggested that uh, climate change has an impact on this Arctic life. Uh, and therefore, we need to take uh, an ecosystem-based approach to management uh, where we look at Arctic ecosystem as a whole, uh, rather than uh, splitting it into parts. And therefore, mainstreaming biodiversity uh, is very important um, in policies uh, that are uh, uh, driven to safeguard uh, the Arctic uh, and uh, its, its uh, life. Over long time scales, Arctic uh, has seen uh, at least 20 cycles of glaciers advancing and retreating over two and a half million years ago. Uh, and so ecosystems and biological communities in the Arctic are very well adapted uh, to climate variability and extremes. Uh, but the more recent climate change and the warming world presents new challenges to these ecosystems and biological communities. And this is very obvious in the lived experiences of climate change um, in the Arctic people. Uh, this is a quote from um, an indigenous elder uh, in Nunavut in Canada. Um, and um, it really characterizes uh, how Arctic uh, has changed. Um, the elder talks about season shifting, ice becoming thinner and weaker, uh, the streams, creeks and rivers uh, having changed their characteristics. So those changes are very obvious uh, and very apparent. Polar bear, of course, is the icon of life in the Arctic as we know it. Uh, and indigenous folklore uh, has a, a lot of um, uh, mentions of, of polar bears uh, as non-human persons. There's a mythology around bears being humans inside their own houses uh, while they put on bear hides when going outside. Um, and the human-like posture of the bears when standing or sitting uh, might have reinforced uh, these ideas uh, of personhood. Um, as Mark mentioned, Arctic uh, is very seasonal. Uh, and so every summer in the Canadian Arctic, millions of sockeye salmon migrate upstream uh, to spawn. Um, and that migration has also been affected uh, by climate change. Uh, more extremes in weather, severe storms or floods uh, wash away salmon eggs, um, and that also destroys spawning habitat uh, for, the, for the salmon. Um, and therefore, we need more information uh, on the distribution of salmon. Uh, and um, uh, with that information, we can better predict uh, how climate and habitat impacts uh, might affect salmon populations. 
uh, there are wonderful uh, stories about Salman um, and the non-human personhood of Salman is also very obvious through these stories. Uh, a wonderful story called The Girl Who Swam uh, With The Fish um, through the indigenous uh, folklore. Uh, a girl uh, uh, got close, very close to a river bank, fell in and turned into a fish uh, that went to the ocean for four years uh, and then returned. Uh, she reported to her people uh, that the fish uh, would only return to rivers uh, where people kept their camps clean and knives sharp. Uh, so these stories uh, really uh, teach young people important lessons in life. Uh, in this case, how to practice uh, fishing um, in a more sustainable uh, way. Another story of Salmon Boy uh, in Tlingit legend uh, is about a boy who showed no respect for the Salmon. Uh, his parents told him uh, to show gratitude uh, and behave properly, but he did not listen. Uh, the Salmon people, uh, personified um, uh, Salmon, um, took him uh, with them into the deep river where he lived with them for several years uh, and learned to be respectful. When he returned, uh, Salmon boy taught people all the things he had learned uh, from the Salmon people uh, and became a healer. Uh, today, the story of Salmon Boy continues to resonate uh, and teaches people to be respectful uh, towards animals. Uh, with my colleague uh, Tom Thornton, um, um, I have recently edited a book on indigenous environmental knowledge. Um, this will be published in a couple of weeks time. Um, and uh, on the cover of this book uh, features uh, Chief Adam Dick, uh, an indigenous elder performing a ceremonial blessing uh, of the injured bald uh, eagle. Uh, and that really typifies uh, people's relationship uh, with animals and biodiversity uh, that they live with. Uh, we suggest in this book uh, that extractive models of indigenous environmental knowledge um, uh, seek only to mine uh, these systems for data. Uh, and these are increasingly viewed uh, critically um, and they are viewed as a form of neo-colonialism. Uh, which ultimately erodes the values of trust and reciprocity uh, that are necessary uh, and that are essential in conducting collaborative research um, uh, with indigenous um, uh, knowledge holders. Uh, the book has case studies of, of indigenous knowledge um, in sustainable management of natural resources uh, and some of these case studies are uh, from the Arctic. So returning uh, to J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, letters uh, from Father Christmas, um, the letters uh, continue for, for a good part of 20 years uh, as Tolkien's uh, children were growing up. Uh, and in some of the last letters, um, uh, it portrays a very hopeful picture of life in the Arctic, um, in, the, in the North Pole ho home of Father Christmas. Um, so Father Christmas says, I'm uh, giving a uh, as big a party tomorrow night as ever I did, polar cubs and snow boys and elves. Polar bear and all the cubs are very well, uh, he tells his children. Uh, they have really been very good this year and have hardly had time to do any mischief. Uh, so this is a whole hopeful portrayal of life uh, in the North Pole. Um, and that really points uh, us to kinship uh, with the Arctic animals as non-human persons uh, and how that kinship can really help safeguard uh, the Arctic life. So I'm going to briefly conclude um, with uh, some remarks about uh, what we can do to safeguard the Arctic life. Uh, and this um, picture of uh, polar bears uh, chewing up uh, wires and cables laid by humans um, is um, uh, really iconic and it suggests uh, that uh, animals uh, have agency in different and very interesting uh, ways. Uh, so all of the animals in the Arctic have agency. Arctic is teeming with life um, and the seasonal environment that we find in the Arctic uh, make that life uh, very rich um, uh, as uh, we would not have expected um, if we think of Arctic purely as uh, ice covered ocean uh, land and permafrost. Uh, we commonly see personhood of animals in popular culture and literature, uh, such as uh, Tolkien's um, letters um, of, from Father Christmas. Uh, in particular, people uh, from the Arctic and their folklore. Um, uh, it, it really suggests a special relationship that people have 
uh, with the animals. Uh, not only because they depend uh, on um, the animals as a resource, uh, but they also live with them in kinship. And so I'm going to suggest that if we think about Arctic animals as our kin, uh, then we can safeguard uh, life uh, in the Arctic better, uh, human as well as non-human life. Thank you. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Carol Brown Leonardi. Thank you, Chanel. The knowledge that I bring to you to, to this discussion originates from my experience of working as a cultural anthropologist in the Arctic region for 16 years. And during this period, I also lived and worked in the Detro region situated in northern Canada for two years, where I was involved in ethnographic fieldwork. I was interested in understanding the Detro Dene relationship with the land and the part of that was to find out their ideas on the environment and how they are placed within it. My goal was to capture the essence of the information that was presented and also to give the Decho Dene some control over the material that would be explored as they presented the issues that concerned them. These concerns were mainly about the historical stories, uh, traditional land use, the stewardship of the land, and the narratives that are presented to you this evening um, gives insight into the Decho Dene physical and spiritual interconnections with the ecology and the depth of their connections in the stewardship of the environment. One may ask, what is a communicative event? And the communicative event is a complete occurrence in the transition of the spoken language between the narrator and the listener. And in this session, I will explore communicative events in the form of ethnographic interviews. And this will show how the Decho Dene use the spoken language in particular social settings. And from this, I aim to promote an understanding of the storyteller audience relationship and how that influences words spoken and the underlying messages that are involved in communicative events. I hope to illustrate that the delivery style of storytelling is affected by the environment in which it is told, which is essential to the understanding of the narrative context. Furthermore, I want to illustrate how the depth of understanding the multi-layered meanings of a narrative often depends on the intensity of the relationship between the storyteller and their audience. Traditionally, the Decho Dene lived along the Mackenzie River, which they call the Decho, translated as river of life. Today they are settled in 10 communities across the region and frequently practice subsistence lifestyle in the bush in allocated family areas. The word Dene means spirit of the land and they assert that they live in the region since the beginning of time and that they have a divine responsibility to steward the land and water. In my relationship with the elders that taught me, I acknowledge that although they did not openly explain why they had selected the narratives that they told, I felt that the exchange of information was based on my understanding of their teaching, and more importantly, on the relationship that we had built between us over a period of time. Some elders spoke in English, a third language for them, which limited the, code, the language codes that are shared and taken for granted in Detro Dene culture and slavery language, which is their official language. I understood that the elders spoke to me in English, my native language, to expose me to a wider code sharing context 
in their narrative. This is important as I understood that my role as a researcher was political for them as I would be introducing their concerns to a wider public who would be hearing about them for the first time as you are hearing about them for the first time. Elder Krauss is a powerful narrator. Her stories are highly personalized and culturally specific. Her narratives were unique as she clearly expressed the sentiments she experienced when living and working traditionally. She also explained how and why events happened in a natural world, giving more detail as the story developed. Elder Krauss spoke a Decho Dene dialect with Anglo-English, which uses words to describe symbols other than their received meaning. While this discourse may appear unsophisticated to many non-Dene, I found that the descriptions from the dialect made the narrative more vivid, which increased my interest of Elder Krauss's experience. So for instance, in summertime, they go in the water. When bulldog biting, they go in the water and they come out, they shake themselves, bulldogs flying. At the personal level, this sentence illustrates one of the many examples that make Elder Krause's narrative unique. Her ability to bring words to life with her clear description of the moose's irritation with the bulldog flies. Elder Krauss's narrative not only informed me about the bush, but also stimulated my imagination with images that I understood to be essential to her life experiences. Words that are familiar to individuals that have some understanding of Dechodene culture and, and traditions have a multitude of layers according to the context. In this case, the use of a term medicine describes a potion that gives Elder Krauss the power to fish successfully. The most, like most traditional skills that are passed down to individuals, the Decho Deni believe that the use of medicine is nurtured in people who are ready. Ready is the slavey term for individuals that are considered responsible enough to use medicine. Elder Krauss gave me the idea that drinking her medicine enabled her to see areas of abundant fish under the water. This helped her to have a successful catch with enough to distribute to other families. I understood from the elders that this rule of generosity is based on the creators making the resources of a bush for everyone to share. Furthermore, the belief that animals give up its life for the hunter also carries the notion that the gift must be shared and must be spared for the next time when the hunter needs it. Personally, this point is pointed to the sustainable use of resources where the hunter only hunts for animals when necessary. Another example is Traficazon. Trapper Kazon told me this narrative on the first evening in the bush camp in Trout Lake in the company of his family following a day of hunting beavers on the river. Our relationship was not as developed as Elder Krause's. Although Trapper Kazon described the rituals that show respect for the animal, I understood that it also acknowledges the animal's medicine power a reciprocity with nature. Traficazon highlights the importance of hanging the moose's hide and leaving the tip of a heart so that the other mooses can see. It seemed to me that by showing respect for the animal, he also acknowledges the animal's ability to connect with the hunter's appreciation and in return that it would give its life up for the hunter as a result. My exposure to the narratives often led me to think about 
what I understood as the various cultural languages. To gain more insight, I thought about the types of activities that had occurred in my experience in the bush meetings and other social settings. Situations such as participating in respecting the river by placing tobacco in the water and praying before the beginning of a journey on the way to Trout River. Furthermore, learning how to trap and hunt animals in the bush involved being mindful that, that it should be performed in specific ways that is respectful to the animals. These experiences increased my awareness of the physical environment which was enhanced by teachings of the Decho Dene customary practices. My engagement with these activities heightened my appreciation of the ways that Decho Dene respect and carry out reciprocal rituals on the land. The language exchange from the elders to me in the form of narratives in these two examples contain metaphors and concepts of the genres that shape the underlying message of the, of the narrative. The message emphasizes the advantages of the land and the moral values connected to traditional lifestyles. The ability to go out and practice traditional land skills may have intensified the description of their narrative and the weight of the delivery. I have highlighted the importance of cultural interaction by showing the methods adopted by the storytellers to pass on their knowledge through narrative. I hope to have given deeper insight into the important decisions that are made by narrators to pass on cultural knowledge and beliefs by adapting the language and narrative forms to suit the listener. I would like to thank you for this opportunity opportunity for listening and I'd like to now pass you on to uh, Tanya. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much Carol. Hello again and um, I decided to call my presentation at home in the Arctic and I will explain to you why. Um, So I'm a native Sakha who was born and grew up in the city of Yakutsk on that map highlighted in yellow. That's the region of Sakha Yakutia, one of the largest administrative units areas of the Russian Federation. Its um, territory is about over actually three million square kilometers. So it's huge. And despite the fact that my hometown is just below the Arctic Circle, most of the area is actually in <clears throat> the Arctic zone. And today I would like to tell you about the Arctic that I'm familiar with as the place where I grew up and I continue to do my research and conduct my field work. We often think we often think of the Arctic as um, the place that is associated with the colors blue and white, and that is um, remote, that has cold temperatures, and we often think about it as a place with vast and endless landscapes of ice and snow, which is true, as you see um, uh, on this very picture, it's a small settlement in the area called um, Evenkia, um, the settlement called Yese in the Krasnoyarsky Krai. And from Mark's presentation, we um, seen the colors of blue and white, and we totally agree that there is plenty of snow and ice. That's absolutely true. Uh, we also often think of the Arctic environment as something that is cold and uh, can be dangerous and uh, sometimes is uh, presented as a hostile environment.
But um, in this presentation, I would like to provide you with a different perspective of the Arctic perspective that is a little bit different from white and blue and what we imagined in our minds just now. I would like you, I would like to take you to the Arctic that is a home, that is a home to many indigenous and native peoples and the home to many species and beings. If you ask my friends or if you asked um, my um, the people whom I work with in the field, how would they imagine their home? And how would they draw a picture of their home? You would be uh, able to see the incredible splashes of color uh, in their depictions of the sunshine, the luscious green grass, wildflowers and berries of the tundra. Indigenous people will describe their home with the emerald green of the new grass, purple and pink of the sunset, bright orange of the cloud berries and yellow of the arctic poppies, as well as pink of the fireweed in the fields. So this picture will be accompanied with very loud noises of very many birds that migrate uh, over there in the summer. Summers might be short, but they are bustling and very busy time of the year. And you can see all these flashes of the color in the works of craftspeople in the Arctic areas, all over Arctic. You will see quite a lot of amazing beadwork that is done, embroidery, patchwork. And that's a true reflection of those very visions of what home is, the warmth, the colors, the um, uh, flowers and plants. Or look at this um, picture of um, celebration, the summer celebration, um, which is traditional to Saha people on the 21st of June. They celebrate summer solstice, which is called, um, celebration is called the Sech. And the costumes and the colors uh, the, of the fabric that these um, costumes are made with are reflective of how they perceive their home, the landscape. The Asiatic lily, a small insect of the, on that particular slide uh, that you can see, is a, is a symbolic flower for Saha people. It is, um, uh, has a lot of significance for Saha. It is um, growing below the Arctic Circle, but nevertheless, it is uh, full of meaning for Saha people. And of course, for indigenous people in the Arctic, their home is associated with the hearth and fire, which is sacred. It's not only a source of heat and warmth in cold winter nights, but it is also a source of spiritual strength and beliefs. For the shaman, the fire is a way to communicate with different deities and spirits and also a way to ask for protection and benevolence. As an anthropologist who works in northern communities, I'm always amazed at the generosity of um, people in these communities with their time, hospitality, knowledge, food and accommodation, and of course their wisdom. And people who um, lived in the Arctic all their life uh, do not complain about freezing temperatures, cold and dark winters or blizzards. They do not see the environment as hostile. And I actually never heard these elders talking or using words such as struggling or fighting or living, um, doing something against when it comes to talking about weather or the elements, environment and landscape. In fact, um, they simply go about it, doing their everyday chores, 
living in the tents at minus 50 during the migrations if need be, fishing through ice holes, traveling long distances to their hunting grounds. They cope and live with the cold, with frosts and with blizzards. And the preposition with here is very important, it seems to me, because it emphasizes the proximity, closeness, and intimacy even. It also points to collaboration and cooperation and mutuality with the environment. People who got used to live in the cold and with um, cold and frozen terrain learned how to use it to their advantage. It provides means for transportation. On the image that uh, you can see on the left there, um, this is, uh, it, it depicts the frozen river actually that turns into a highway in winter and provides infrastructural link between two banks of the river. And of course, there is also permafrost. That is a natural phenomenon which refers to the underground earth uh, that has negative temperatures for prolonged periods of time. And people learned how to build their houses and roads on permafrost, how to preserve food using permafrost all year round. And again, on one of the images there, you can see how people carve out the earth to create some sort of ice house to keep their food uh, and store their food in um, uh, freezing temperatures all year round. Rivers and lake make um, and lake ice is a source of fresh water, but it is also a building material. And of course, um, ice is also a source of creativity and um, artistic pursuits. In her book um, called Do Glaciers Listen? Julie Cruikshank, a Canadian anthropologist, describes how glaciers are seen by native peoples in Canada as living beings, as animate, and how they respond to people's behavior. They do not tolerate disrespectful or arrogant behavior, and the perception of environment, whether of glaciers, permafrost or forests or rivers or lakes as sentient beings is very common in the Arctic. And this is because people believe that they are not the only beings living there. So people learned how to live with glaciers, with permafrost, with colds and with frozen rivers. And they learned to live in the Arctic but they also learned to live with the Arctic. Thank you very much. I'll pass on to Mark. Thank you very much, Tatania. That was amazing. And thank you colleagues for four fascinating uh, presentations. Now I've got some time for some questions. Um, what I'll do is pass them to people I think is, is relevant for, but if you've got something to add, please let me know um, and you can join in. Uh, the first question uh, for Seanil, um, how can the idea of animals as persons be harnessed to focus our minds on climate change? And which institutions have genuine power to address climate change? Thanks, Mark. This is a really fascinating question. Um, and I think um, if we recognize that animals have agency, uh, they become part of the groups and institutions that are addressing uh, climate change. Um, ultimately, it will be people uh, who are speaking for animals, uh, but the first step uh, really is to recognize that animals uh, also have a voice um, and their perspective uh, needs to feature uh, when we focus our minds on addressing climate change. Um, I think all institutions have the power to address climate change from small to big organizations, government agencies, uh, international institutions, uh, but I think speaking uh, the voice of the animals um, is what um, will really help uh, to safeguard biodiversity um, and also the people of the Arctic. 
Thanks. Thanks, Shono. Uh, one of the wonderful things about uh, being involved in uh, giving a, 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 an event like this is that lots of people that ask questions um, come in with some really high level questions that are quite challenging. And we've got a really interesting one on Greenland that um, I'll have a go at, but also I think uh, Peter might be able to have a go at, um, but it's hard. It's from uh, uh, Paul Boer from the British Ecological Society. And he's asked, how long have people been living in the high Arctic? And are there any reflections on how the Inuit of Etta in Northwest Greenland became so isolated from other Inuit? And when did Inuit peoples arrive in Eastern Greenland? Now I'll have a go at the uh, Northwest Greenland bit. As a physicist, uh, people, indigenous peoples live uh, where there are resources. And there's a very interesting uh, oceanographic feature in Northwest Greenland called the Polynya, the Northwest uh, Polynya. And it's open water where the ocean keeps the ice away from the surface because of the meteorology going on, which means it's an area that you can fish uh, and you can hunt whales and whales and seals go there. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's, uh, it's been used quite a lot in filming in documentaries. Um, so that could be one reason, but for how long people have been living in the high Arctic and any other comments, Peter, would you like to have a go please? Ah, you're on mute, Peter. I get to say that. And... Vladimir uh, Pitolko is a um, uh, professor at the Russian Academy of Science who has done uh, excellent research ex excavations in uh, the high Arctic in Russia. So from his own um, work, he has noticed that there's uh, at least 32,000 years of human Arctic inhabitation. And this is in the Yana sites. Uh, and he goes even further than saying around maybe 40,000 years, some examples of that, but continuously around 32,000 years. Um, so when, when did Inuit people arrive in East, Eastern Greenland? Well, there's, due to these climatic shifts, what I've been uh, mentioned very briefly, uh, there have been different moves of human migrations. One of the big moves was the Thule move that was uh, 1200 to 1300 when they came to, to Greenland. And before that, already in 4500, were the first uh, Inuits or well, Arctic ancestors, we call them let's say Arctic ancestors, that moved to Greenland. So since uh, 4,500 years, there's uh, ongoing with different shifts uh, in habitation in Greenland. Thank you, Peter. Um, Carol, I have two questions for you that I'm gonna bundle up together, please. The first one's really interesting. Uh, how are you archiving your oral narratives and the follow-on question is, is really interesting. Is giving primacy to indigenous perceptions and narratives about the Arctic potentially counterproductive in that the threats to the region are not locally produced but the result of Western capitalism? Um, yes, they are very interesting uh, questions. Um, I, I have my own archive that I do um, keep with the, the information that I have. And um, much of my information is sent back to um, the indigenous communities that I work in. So, um, and there are um, double copies of um, the oral narratives um, that have been taken. So everything that I uh, record has been returned as, as well as um, uh, the work that I, I have, I also keep for myself, and they are uh, written in um, publications and, and, and so on and so forth. So they are sent to uh, uh, libraries and, and, and um, educational institutions. Um, and I have to ask for a little repeat of the following. Question. No, that's fine. So the, the, the second part of the question is, 
Is giving primacy to indigenous perceptions and narratives about the Arctic potentially counterproductive in that the threats to the region are not locally produced, but the result of Western capitalism? Um, well, I believe that the narratives are very important because we need to have a, a full understanding of um, the indigenous perception because they are not to be made um, to be invisible. So I don't think that it is uh, counterproductive, uh, not, uh, not at all. And also, um, in terms of uh, uh, non-renewable resource development, um, there needs to be an understanding of, um, you know, the, the area that uh, people are working in, that companies and development um, uh, industries are working in these areas, and they need to have an understanding of, of, um, of the region, and as well as, um, if at all possible, to have Indigenous people working alongside uh, um, of any development so that these uh, things can be uh, marshaled. Um, so I hope this kind of, this answers the question. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Carol. To Tanya, I have a, a question about the Russian government, I think. Um, does the Moscow government's extraction of resources like gas and oil cause friction with the native peoples of Saka and Yakutia and how is this overcome or dealt with? And that's from Lawrence Mitchell. And I apologize if I got the pronunciations incorrect. Absolutely fine. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for your question. It is a very topical question. One that um, is not pertinent only for Saha, but also for the whole Arctic, Russian Arctic, where there are quite a lot of resources and um, they are being extracted and uh, there are various forms of operations for industrial developments in the north of Russia and yes it does have certain forms uh, ways of frictions and potentially conflicts with the different governments uh, different uh, companies however um, as Carol said um, just now, I think the way to go about it, obviously the development needs to happen. The way it should happen is a way of negotiations with communities. And that's where both and three sides actually, governments, local governments and uh, native local communities need to agree what happens sometimes is that uh, local communities are missing from these negotiations and that's the situation that needs to be um, changed, in my opinion. Does that answer the question? I think that's an answer. If anyone would like to contribute uh, uh, more colour to it, that would be welcome. But if not, I'll move on to my next question, which I think is possibly one for Peter. Um, uh, in that it's uh, about the exhibits. Uh, what are the Saka fabrics and how are they dyed these wonderful colours? And that's from Susie Arnott. I'm, I'm sorry, from which? Uh, from the Saka? Yes. Maybe Tanya, Tanya can so answer this one. <laughs> uh, maybe Tanya, you could uh, answer this one better. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a very good question. The Fabric sometimes comes uh, obviously already, you know, it's um, a, a ready-made fabric, although traditional Saha uh, would use dyes um, to, to, to color fabric. And that was natural dyes. They would use the bark. They would use different grasses and uh, plant uh, dyes to, to make uh, uh, colors. Now what you see is obviously very vibrant colors that are um, readily produced and manufactured. But this is not to say that um, 
it diminishes in any way people's perception. Uh, you know, it, it, when, when I said that they would like to see that in these bright colors, this is exactly what it is. Um, beads, however, were traditional for many centuries and uh, the way people were decorating and embroidering the hats, mittens and um, footwear was absolutely amazing. It's a rainbow colors. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing these in the museum. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, a kind of fun fact, but um, we have this one uh, dolcon. Uh, it's for the snow, snow, uh, for the snow, like protecting for the snow uh, goggles. No goggles. Glasses. No. And it's got uh, uranium beads. And they're really bright yellow. So it's really beautiful. <laughs> Worrying, uranium. <laughs> so it was always going to be the way that we uh, got far more questions than we do time. But I've got just one more question before we have to finish. Um, and it's a nice one. And Carol, I wonder if this is one that you wouldn't mind answering. Um, from Karen Yule, are there any projects where children are documenting the seasons as they grow up that you know of? Um, well, in the summertime, in the in some of the areas that I have been working in, uh, they usually have um, the children's summer camps. The children spend a long time um, in the wilderness, or what the uh, Decho Denny would call the bush, and they um, document um, the the plants and the animals that they see, and they they learn a subsistence lifestyle um, and that is all connected to the environment in, in you know it could be the summertime and sometimes they they do go out in the autumn as well and these things tend to be seasonal and um, they are um, what we call what they call bush camps for children and um, they are very uh, very very nice and and very um, informative and a way of passing on um, you know subsistence lifestyle traditions and also it gives the children the space to hear um, oral narratives uh, that are traditionally passed down from one generation to the next. I hope that answers the question. Thank you Carol and unfortunately we have run out of time so I'm going to have to uh, stop it. Um, if you've got any more questions, uh, I would recommend uh, going to the uh, British Museum website and our names are on there. You can use Google and email us and I'm all, we'd be delighted to follow up. There are also uh, links on the British Museum website to OU courses uh, around the, the polar regions and Arctic regions. But it remains for me to uh, thank the British Museum for hosting us and my colleagues, Dr. Peter Louvers, Professor Shonil Bagwat, uh, Dr. Carol uh, uh, Brown Leonardi and Dr. Tanya Arganova Lowe for being such great com companions this evening. It was really interesting. Thank you very much for coming. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.